Well, welcome back to Fellowship Bible Chapel and the second hour this morning with Jacob Prash. I want to do something, though, before we start. Every Sunday, every time we have one of these events, there's a group of people, Mike, Joe, Dan, Brian, and others that come in early to set up all of this equipment, the cameras, the the curtains here and all this stuff, the stage, John Dickey as well. And I just want to publicly thank them because that it's very vital to what we do here at Fellowship Bible Chapel uh, for these people to come and take that time and sacrifice. And they do it week after week after week. So you can pray that uh, we uh, someday maybe get um, a big donor or something or two big donors and we can get a permanent place so we don't have to tear down and set up. But I do appreciate these guys doing this. Also preach Jacob, he's been a friend uh, to us in the ministry since we started four years ago. And uh, there's a lot of things that Jacob does that people don't know, ministering to pastors in China and Vietnam. And sometimes I get an email, he's hiding out in the hotel room someplace because they might be looking for him. Uh, South Africa, Indonesia, people that don't really have a, a connection with it. And I know he doesn't talk about it, but you need to know that that's a lot of what the ministry of Moriel is about. And he does this at great risk to himself and his health, to be honest with you. He's on the road a lot, and we do appreciate that, but we really appreciate his teaching. So here again is Jacob Prash. Yeah, I once hid in a hotel room in Vietnam for three weeks. My wife was looking for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, a true story. I like telling people this. I was with my wife at Hanukkah and Christmas in New York City this December. New Year. And uh, as I always do at Christmas time, I went to see Handel's Messiah. It's just something I do that I don't care about Christmas trees and all that stuff, but I like the nativity and so forth. So I went to see Handel's Messiah. Of course, Handel's Messiah was premiered in Dublin at Easter, not Christmas. Nonetheless, it's become something absorbed into popular Christmas Christian culture. So I went to Carnegie Hall with my wife in Manhattan to see Handel's Messiah. And uh, <clears throat> I don't think there'd be any more than maybe two or three people in all those choral singers and musicians that were Christians, if there were that many. And New York is a very liberal city. I don't think there were many Christians in the, the audience of a few thousand people. They just go because it's cultural and because Handel was a good composer, and it's just what they do at Christmas. So I went there, and as the tradition is, with the Hallelujah Chorus, people stand up, and when the choir is singing, He shall reign forever and ever, all these couple of thousand unsaved people stand up and begin clapping enthusiastically. He shall reign forever and ever. Now they thought they were clapping for the music or something like that, or for the orchestra. For this orchestra. That, the words were, he shall reign forever and ever, and they stand up and yeah, he will get the glory. This world may be dark, but every knee shall bow. He stands up. The next day was the first day of Hanukkah, and I went to Temple Emanuel. It's a synagogue in New York I go to. Not that I go to synagogues, but for cultural reasons, I go in the high holy days with my family to the synagogues basically to keep up relations with the Jewish community, because if you don't do that, you can't witness to them. So I went there with my wife to Temple Emmanuel, and it was, it's liberal, it's reformed, it's not like the Orthodox. And we're there, and the men and women can sit, sit together, not on separate sides and things like that. And the cantor, the, the lead musician and singer, she opens the Torah scrolls, faces Jerusalem, and begins singing from Yehuda the Maccabee by Handel. There are, again, by, like Messiah, there's one called Yehuda, you know, Yehuda the Maccabee, and the excerpt from it is where we get the Christian hymn, Thine Be the Glory. And I'm in the synagogue with these unbelieving Jews, 
And the rabbi and the cantor are facing Jerusalem with the word of God open, singing, Thine be the glory, risen, conquering son. No idea the singing about the Messiah, Yeshua. <laughs> it's just religious and cultural. But they're facing Jerusalem with the word of God, and they're singing, Thine be the glory. And this is New York City, and this is where I'm from. <laughs> I saw it in Carnegie Hall the next day. I saw it in Temple Emmanuel on Fifth Avenue. You know, he's still in control. He's still in control. No matter what happens, he's the boss. <laughs> he will get the glory. But to see that in Carnegie Hall and then to see it in a synagogue, even in a synagogue that rejects him, they don't know the singing to him, but they are. Well, that's like Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, Paul tells us. When they read the Torah, they don't know they're reading about Yeshua, about Jesus, but they are. They're reading about him. When we read something like the book of Revelation, we see things like the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And then I saw. I've explained this before on our Amos 8 teaching, the two Greek words for time, chronos and kairos. Eternity is not a clock that keeps going. It's no clock at all. There is no kairos in eternity. Yet there is a chronos, we get the word chronology, an order of events. How can you have chronos without kairos? Events taking place out of time. The book of Revelation speaks of future events in the past tense. It speaks of past events in the present tense. Past, present, and future are all the same, yet there's an order. Well, as I explained on the Amos 8 tape, and it's not our subject today, The scripture speaks of the death of a believer biologically, not his death. There's no death for believers. Our funeral is over. When you were baptized in water by immersion, that was your funeral. Don't think about your funeral. It's over. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> death is for non unsaved people. Christians just go to sleep. Now, that's true from the aspect of they wake up again, the resurrection. That is true. But there's another aspect. When you go to sleep, neurophysiologists tell us we all dream. You enter a different sphere of consciousness. There are things that make sense when you're asleep in a dream that could make no sense in your waking hours. You see past events happening in the present. You see future events transpiring. You see people who have died, they're alive again, and you're talking to them. Things that could make no sense when you're awake make sense in the dream. Well, eternity is like that. It'll make sense when you get there. <laughs> there's a chronos. There's an order of events. But there's no kairos. There's no clock. <laughs> there's no past, present, and future. Yet there's an order. Now, those who have fallen asleep, remember, again, we explained this on the thanatology tapes as well. Death is not a mystery. There are many mysteries in the scripture. Mystery of uh, Christ, the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of iniquity, of lawlessness. There are many mysteries in the scripture, but death is not one of them. People mystified it, not God. If you want to know what you're going to see, read the book of Revelation. What happens when you give up the ghost? Well, look at the martyrdom of Stephen. What did he see? Jesus at the right hand of the Father and the saints. That's what you're going to see. That's what I'm going to see. It's no mystery. We made it a mystery. The word of God is pretty clear about it. There are many mysteries in the Bible things that have to be unveiled. But when you give up the ghost, is not one of them. There's no death. Your consciousness just enters a different sphere. There's no death. Death is for unsaved. I'm talking for Christians now. I'm not talking for unsaved people. They got a big problem once they get saved. Well, you know. So you have these order of events where past, present, and future are the same. Now, as we explained on the Amos 8 tape, Kairos, the clock, that kind of time depends on planetary motion. Even though we have atomic clocks that work by particle emission, they still have to be calibrated in nanoseconds based on planetary motion. So you have no, you, you have no mechanism to measure time other than planetary motion. 
you have, Paul says there's three, you enter the third heaven. The first heaven being the atmosphere of the earth, the second heaven being out of space, and the third being eternity. It's the second one, the Shemaim in, in Hebrew. Uranus in Greek is rolled up like a scroll. Out of space is rolled up, and eternity meets the earth. <laughs> the kingdom comes. That's what happens. The heavens are rolled up. Jesus comes, the heavens, they see the sign of the sky, and the heavens are rolled up. The third heaven meets the first one. The second one is rolled up like a scroll. Um, so when you read the book of Revelation, how does this happen? The order of events are very, very complicated, it would appear. And it's using pressure interpretations, among other mechanisms. The book of Revelation always follows an Old Testament literary motif. It reads like the Old Testament. For instance, you see the nativity narrative of the dragon trying to kill the baby coming out of the woman. It replays the nativity. What the Antichrist is going to do is going to replay what Herod did. That's why you see Herod associate the, the dragon in Revelation with, with, the, with the ten heads, the seven heads, ten, ten horns. goes back to Daniel 7. Well, Herod in the character of the Antichrist. And then it says, when the man-child is rescued, the, the dragon becomes enraged with the woman and makes war with the rest of her offspring. Well, what did Herod do? He went back and he killed the other babies in Bethlehem. He was, that's a pressure interpretation. One event is replayed, recapitulated. It's a picture. It's speaking of the past and the future. Again, history is future history. Well, although the seven seals and the seven vials and the seven trumpets are sequential. When you get to the seventh trumpet, the text of Revelation, chapters 11, 12, 13, they revert and they tell the same story from a different perspective. That's not sequential until you get to the seven vials. It can be quite confusing. What time frame is it talking about? There are shifting time frames. Now, we're never going to understand how this happens in the book of Revelation unless we understand that the book of Revelation has an Old Testament literary motif. All of its symbolism and the way it deals with apocalyptic comes from the Old Testament. Remember Daniel? It tells the same story twice from two different aspects. <laughs> right? The four sections of Nebuchadnezzar's image correspond to the four beasts he tells the same story again unless you understand the structure of prophetic time in the old testament you'll never understand how the book of revelation works not that i've got it all figured out by any means i just understand there's a structural issue we have to understand shifting time frames shifting time frames. Pay attention. Remember to God, past, present, and future are all the same. There's an order of events, but they're outside of time. Prophecy is written from his perspective, not from ours. He wants us to see it as he sees it. Okay. He wants us to see it as he sees it. Okay. All of Israel's prophets, as I've said 20 million times, prophesied for their own time, prophesied for the first coming of Christ as the suffering servant, the sin bearer, who raises from the dead, and they prophesy for his glorious return. They prophesy for their own time, for the first coming and the second. Unless we understand the Sitzimnebin, the cultural situation and the historical setting of the prophet's own time, we don't have a good base or platform to understand what they're saying about the future. Always begin with the arithmetic, not the calculus. There's no point in attempting differential calculus unless you do the arithmetic. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Okay. Do the arithmetic first. Find out what the historical setting 
the cultural situation is the prophet is prophesying. Then we can see what's for his own time, what's for the first coming, what's for the second. But then you get into differential calculus. <laughs> Let me explain how this works. Calculus is the branch of mathematics that exp explains change. Well, scripture is like that. It shifts. Not only is there for his own time, for the first coming and for the second, but sometimes he's speaking in a pressure interpretation. He's speaking for two time frames in the same verse or the same passage. A pressure interpretation, like Revelation 12. It tells the Christmas story <laughs> as a picture of what's going to happen. How do I explain this? It was copied by human authors. You know the playwright by Arthur Miller, who was married to Marilyn Monroe. He wrote The Crucible during the McCarthy era. He was writing a docufiction based on what happened in Salem, Massachusetts, as a covert way to address McCarthyism in the 1950s, <laughs> the witch hunts. He was telling, retelling the story of Salem from a particular aspect in order to address what was going on with McCarthy and, and Roy Cohen and stuff like that with the political witch hunts in the McCarthy era. Well, Scripture does that. It retells one story to address another one. It takes something from the past and retells it or reframes it with different points of emphasis and modification to address what is happening or what's going to happen. Now again, we'll all do recognition of the talents of Arthur Miller. <laughs> he didn't invent that. Scripture did. <laughs> okay. James Joyce did the same thing with Ulysses, didn't he? When he took the story of Leopold Bloom in Ireland and he we told it as the story of Ulysses from Homer. I mean, okay, these, these are brilliant authors, but the concept was in the scripture before they did it. Remember, when you read what happened, you're reading about what's going to happen. <laughs> we don't study history just to find out how we got to where we are. We study history to find out how we're where we're going. <laughs> Begin with the history before you do the prophecy. Unless you know where you came from, you won't know where you're going. I hate to sound like a broken record, but people have got to get this basic concept. We need to understand these scriptures before Jesus comes. We need to know how to identify the Antichrist before he comes. We need to know what to do, what to expect. And we don't have a lot of time to learn. Begin with the basics. An interesting person in the history of American sport was the football coach, Vince Lombardi. His autobiography was quite a book. He was quite a character. If his team lost the game, or even if they won the game, but didn't play as well as he thought they should. Before he did the post-mortem, the autopsy, when they watched the film of the game the next day and say, you should have done this, it would have been better if we did that. Before they did that, he'd have them up right and early the next morning, Monday morning, whatever it was, and they would practice things like blocking <laughs> and, and passing and kicking. And they'd always go back to the basic things of, of, of the sport. Now, these are professional athletes who played college football well enough to get into the NBA, I mean, uh, NFL and things like this. These are professional athletes, but he kept bringing these guys back to the basic stuff. Well, studying God's word is the same. We always go back to the basic concepts. Once you get the foundation right, it's amazing how fast the rest of it will come. When I was a little boy in New York, I used to walk around Manhattan. My mother didn't like me hanging out in Manhattan, but I liked it. 
So I go around Manhattan, and in those days, before there were computer video graphics, there would be an architect's drawing of what a skyscraper was going to look like after it was built, and it would be on a billboard. And then they had these wooden panels around the construction site, and they'd cut holes in it, and then they'd have little lower ones so little kids could look through and see what was going on, and, and you can watch it. And I'd go there, and I was always fascinated by it. I'm looking at that sign with the, the billboard with the picture of the architect's drawing what the skyscraper is going to look like. 40, 50, 60 stories, maybe. I'm looking at it. Manhattan is mostly bedrock. It's, it's a good place to build skyscrapers. And these guys are digging down and down and down, and they've got all this earth-moving equipment and caterpillars and pounding, and they're blasting. And boom, boom, boom. I'm looking through the hole, and... and uh, they're going the wrong direction. <laughs> As a little kid, what do I know? You know, you know, you go in the wrong direction. You know, you go in that. and they're digging that bound. Once they got that foundation in with the steel reinforced concrete and the, and the natural bedrock, once they did that, it was amazing how fast the rest of it went up. It was incredible. Brrr. Girders, panels. Brrr. Next thing you know, they're doing the interior decorating and bringing in the furniture. Brrr. You're looking at that architect's drawing. Not his campaign. Not your campaign. There it goes. Get the foundation right. We've lost sight of the foundations. There are basic principles of biblical interpretation that certain churches certainly the original brethren the original brethren would have known that are a lost art people don't study the scriptures the way the early brethren among others did but the brethren are a good example they understood We put a lot of emphasis on getting the basic principles right. Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 11. Ishayahu Anavi. When is he talking about his own time? When is he talking about the first coming? When is he talking about the second? Or when is he speaking in a compound sense about both? But then it gets more complicated. What is only for Israel and the Jews? What is Judeocentric? And what is for Israel and the Jews that also has application to the church? <laughs> First coming, second coming, his own time. Literal, figurative, is it a pressure interpretation? Is he speaking of two different time frames at the same time? Is it only for Israel, or is it for Israel and the church? It's like a big, long, quadratic equation. My wife's a math teacher. She takes these big, long, <laughs> second-order differential equations, and she knows how to reduce them to a simple mathematical statement that even a moron like me could understand once she explains it. My wife, I told you about my wife. She's the only mathematician in the world who can't balance a checkbook. But she's good at, <laughs> but she's good at equations and logarithms. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 11. Pay attention. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and strength. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And will not judge by what his eyes see. Nor make decision by what he hears. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. 
a stem will spring, a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. The root of Jesse. I'll write it in English. Shoresh Ishai, the root of Jesse. Now understand, this comes from the book of Ruth. I've explained before, Matthew chapter 0. Matthew chapter 1 is the genealogy of Jesus. But it simply resumes where Ruth chapter 4, the end of the book of Ruth, leaves off. Think of Ruth chapter 4 as Matthew chapter 0. Okay. Jesse is the father of David Hamelech, okay, King David, a type of Christ in his second coming, and a picture of Jesus as the good shepherd, the conquering king who sets up the kingdom. Okay. The line of Jesse comes about through a marriage of a Gentile Moabitess, Ruth, a race that had been hostile to the Jews. And Boaz, a wealthy Jew. A marriage of Jew and Gentile would produce the line of Jesse, through whom King David would be born, resulting in the royal or the regal line of Judah, through which the Messiah would come. The Messiah had to come through a union of Jew and Gentile because he'd be the savior of both. Abraham was a Gentile who God converted to Judaism. Through Abraham, all the tribes of the earth would be blessed because the seed of Abraham, the Messiah, would be the savior of all. Okay. So the Mashiach, the Messiah, would come. You see, two Jewish women in the ancestry of Jesus. Not only do you see Ruth, but we also see Rahab, a prostitute. Who is going to boast about having a shiksa hooker for an ancestor? <laughs> My great, 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 great grandmother used to turn tricks on the street corner. She was a shiksa hooker. <laughs> the Son of Man came to save sinners. He came to save Jew and Gentile. The royal line of David was a Jew-Gentile mixture. And it contained iniquitous people who repented and believed. This is the legal line, also known as the Leverite line. Luke goes through Mary. Luke's genealogy goes through Mary, and it's universal. It goes back to Adam. Matthew is the Jewish line, the legal line, and the royal line begins with Abraham, but it shows the root of Jesse. So the Messiah had to have Gentiles in his ancestry. Now we can say a lot more of this if we ever did a teaching on the genealogies. He also had to have Levites, priests, in his genealogy. John the Baptist was from the tribe of Levi, but he was the first cousin of Jesus. How could that be? Well, we, ex we have teachings, we explain it. Because the Messiah could, had to be both a king and a priest. Only the Messiah could be both king and priest. Everyone else, the kings had to be descendants of David and the priests of Aaron from a different tribe of Levi. The Messiah had to unify the two. But as far as the root of Jesse, he had to unify Jew and Gentile. The royal line would come through this. These are important things. Now, it says... A branch from his roots will bear fruit. 
meaning the fruit of the Spirit. Turn with me, please, to Matthew. Matthew's nativity narrative. Chapter 2, verse 31. And came and lived in a city called Nazareth, Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. There is no such verse in the Old Testament. This verse at the end of the second chapter of Matthew is called a formula citation. A formula citation says this is the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy about Jesus. He shall be called a Nazarene. But there's no such verse. How do we work this out? Nazar Netzer. Biblical Hebrew contains inherent literary features not found in English in the same way. In English, certainly, if we use wordplay, one word that sounds like another, we do it as a joke. I don't know if I've ever explained this before in Ohio. I remember as a little boy in New York, I saw an advertisement in the newspaper for a company that sold coal, and they called it Quality Coal, K-O-A-L. They intentionally misspelled it to draw your attention to the advert. If we do it in English, it is an advertising gimmick, or it is a joke. In Hebrew, it's the opposite. In Biblical Hebrew, it's there deliberately to draw your attention to something important. It is a hint, a clue, called a remez, telling you there is typology in it. It's called a remez. Let me explain this a bit further to understand what Isaiah is doing. Look with me, if you don't know, to the eighth chapter of Amos. The Lord showed me and behold, there was a basket of summer fruit. What do you see, Amos? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then he said to me, the end has come for my people Israel. I'll spare them no longer. The sun in the Middle East is so hot, if it's not harvested by summer, it's going to get burned up. The terminal end, termination. Kets, kets, kets. Summer. Kites. Prihakites. Sell prihakites. A basket of summer fruits. What do you see? I see a basket of kites. Fruit kites. Summer fruit kites. Because the kets has come. You use one word that is almost pronounced and spelled the same in order to bring somebody's attention to something important. Okay? Another example of this. No Nazarene, but there is the vow of the Nazarite prefiguring Christ. People like Samson. Paul took the Nazarite vow in, in Acts. Okay. He's a Nazarite. Samuel, these guys were Nazarites. Um, Samson, they were Nazarites. A lot of people. Kites, 
significance. So while there is no verse that says he shall be called a Nazarene, No vow of the Nazarite is applied directly to Jesus. It's only a type. And there's no verse, he shall be called a Nazarene. Nazar, Nazar, Nazar. But you do have passages in Isaiah and Jeremiah that says the Messiah shall be a righteous branch. Netzer, Netzer, Nezer, Netzer. You understand? These things are hard to translate into another language. That's why Nehemiah 8.8 says the priority is always on the original script, the original manuscript languages. Nezer, Netzer. The Messiah will be a righteous branch. He's using a literary device common in the Hebrew scriptures. So when the rabbis say, oh, there's no such verse in the Tanakh in our Hebrew scriptures that the Messiah will be called a Nazarene. Yeah, but look what Amos did. <laughs> you know. Everybody understands how this works. Now, let's have a little more fun. I believe... Most of the people who agree with me, well, all of them believe, and a lot of other people believe, there is a period between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 9, in which the age of the church and most, not all, but most of the time of the Gentiles occurs. They overlap. The age of the church and the time of the Gentiles are not the same, but the age of the church occurs in that period. How do you say that? On what basis can you cut it? Well, let's look. Turn with me, please, to Isaiah 62. I'm sorry, Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord, in verse 1, is upon me. Because the, God has, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news, the word gospel, besorah, to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to all who mourn. Now we can actually know what time of the year Jesus read this and this happened because of the Perak or the portion of the week, the Torah portion that Jesus was reading at this time of year, in Luke chapter 4, he reads this. And he's in the synagogue in his hometown, in Nezer. Nezer. Nazareth. Okay. The modern Hebrew word for nominal Christian is Notzrim. Born-again believers are called Maminim, believers. But nominal Christians, the Hebrew term for a Christian is a notri. <laughs> he came to Nazareth in verse 16, where he'd been brought up, as was his custom. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. He was the visiting rabbi. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives 
and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He closed the book, actually he would have rolled up a scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes in all the synagogue were fixed on him. Why did he only read half the verse? <laughs> the favorable year of the Lord. The other half of the verse says, and the day of vengeance of our God. That's his purpose in his second coming, not his first. He only reads what he was going to do in his first coming. As Messiah, son of Joseph, Hamashiach ben Yosef. Not as Messiah, son of David, Hamashiach ben David in his return. That's coming. The day of his vengeance. The wrath of the Lord. Well, let's look at another one. Turn with me to John's Nativity now. With the Gospel of St. John. When Jesus is crucified in uh, John 19. He's hanging on the cross. And they crucified him, and they put up the inscription, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Pilate puts up the sign, King of the Jews, they didn't like it. Now on the cross, Jesus was our high priest making atonement on the altar, but he was also the king. Only the Messiah could be both the king and the priest. Okay. So when we look upon this, it says in John, that it is written, they shall look upon him who they have pierced. They shall look upon him who they have pierced. That's what it says. They look upon him who they have pierced. Well, let's look at where that's written in the Old Testament. We see in verse 37, and another scripture says, they'll look upon him who they pierced. Well, let's look at Zechariah 12. Verse 10. I will pour it on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, speaking in the first person through Zechariah by the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus speaking personally. Whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Well, in John, at the crucifixion, they weren't mourning for him. They were saying, crucify him. Only the first half of the verse is fulfilled. You see it. Just as they look at the bottom of the appears. Where, when are they going to mourn? That still has to happen. Look with me to Revelation chapter 1. Verse 7, behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So be it, amen. It cuts the verse in half. So now it's no longer a case where this verse is for the first coming, this verse is for the second coming, this verse is for the first and second coming, this verse is for the prophet's own time. Now it's this half of the verse is for the first coming, this half is for the second. It gets more and more complex, doesn't it? Do the arithmetic before you try the calculus. Suffering servant in his first coming, conquering king in his second. When you get that basic concept, you see why the verses get cut in half. It all adds up. 
when you get the basic concept of Hebrew wordplay, it all adds up. The Pesha interpretation. One event is a picture of another. Most of you know this very quickly. Matthew 2.15. Out of Egypt I called my son when Herod dies. Quotes Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. Out of Egypt I called my son. Hosea is talking about the exodus with Moses. Matthew says it's about Jesus. It's a Pesher. The Pesher interpretation. The Peshet The Hebrew word pashut, the simple, literal, straightforward meaning. Don't go any further until you get the peshet. You can't base a doctrine on typology or symbolism, or a remez, or a midrash. You can only base doctrine on what's literally stated. Get the peshet. Well, how can this be about Jesus? With Abraham, God judges Pharaoh. Abraham comes out of Egypt, Genesis. Abraham's descendants in the Exodus. God judges a wicked king. Israel comes out of Egypt. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. When we're born again, we come out of Egypt. It's a figure of the world. The rapture and resurrection. They brought Joseph's bones with them out of Egypt. It's a future event. It's a picture of the parousia, the return of Christ. Pharaoh's a magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron. Like Antichrist and false prophet are going to counterfeit the miracles. It's a, it's a peshet. We come out of Egypt. Israel comes out of Egypt. Abraham comes out of Egypt. The Messiah comes out of Egypt. God judges a wicked king. That is the pesher. Again, you read the Crucible by Arthur Miller. The Pesher, it's talking about Salem, Massachusetts. The Pesher, he's making a political commentary about McCarthyism. <laughs> Same idea. Get the basics. Arithmetic is not that hard. Once you understand those basic principles, then you can go further. Let's continue now. Isaiah chapter 11. The fruit is obviously the divine nature, the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians. Now in Hebrew it can be counted as six or seven. In the Septuagint, Translation, the Greek Old Testament, it's seven. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit, of wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. In Revelation, it's called the sevenfold spirits of God. God does not have seven spirits. It's not seven holy spirits. It is better translated sevenfold. You know the rainbow at the celestial throne. It's based on the spectrum, isn't it? You go from ultraviolet to infrared, there's seven basic colors corresponding to the sevenfold spirit of God. There's not seven spirits. They're each a dimension of the same spirit, just like the spectrum, the rainbow. With Noah, God put the rainbow, remember? The arch, the arch, the keshet, he put the bow as a testimony. It's the sevenfold spirit of God. It's there. The Holy Spirit is a testimony of Jesus in us. It's 
So it's talking about the first coming of Jesus. That's what he's going to do. Who delight in the fear of the Lord, in verse 2, not judge by what his eyes see, nor make decision what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. That becomes transitional. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. The time frame now shifts from his first coming to his second. Verse 3 is transitional. Verse 4 is speaking purely of his second coming. Everybody see that, or at least primarily. The time frame shifts. Verse 1, verse 2, first coming. Verse 3, that's more nebulous. Something's happening here, though. Things are changing. Verse 4, it's talking about a second coming. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. That's about his first coming and his second. Verse 6. Pay attention. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together, a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Time frame now shifts. What follows the second coming? The millennial kingdom. Understand the millennium. The original plan that God had for planet Earth and for mankind cannot be thwarted by the sin of Adam or the designs of Satan. It still has to happen. God had a plan to do it a certain way, and it's still going to happen. The earth will be restored to its Adamic state before man fell. There will be geophysical changes to the biosphere, explained in the book of Ezekiel particularly, affecting the geography of Jerusalem and the Middle East. The earth will be restored to what it had been before man fell. What would have happened if Adam didn't sin? That's what the millennium will be like. There are things that foreshadow it. Remember David conquered all the nations around Israel and ruled with a rod of iron and brought peace? That's a picture of the millennium, among other things. Now understand this. There are three culprits we have to deal with now the world, the flesh, and the devil. In the millennium, there will be the earth, not the world. <coughs> Nothing's going to be there to tempt us. Satan will be bound. The tempter will not be there. No world, just the earth. No Satan. He's bound to the end of the millennium. That just leaves the flesh. But there's nothing to tempt or incite it to sin. Think of a baby crawling around on the floor. The baby has a fallen nature but doesn't know it. It doesn't know what sin is. That is the way people will be in the millennium. There'll be two kinds of people in the millennium. There'll be us, our bodies will be akin to the body Christ had in his resurrection. Be the same body, but it will look different. And it will have supernatural, being that with supernatural capacities. The people born in the millennium 
will be like us, except they will have the longevity of antediluvian man. They'll live to be these fantastic ages. If somebody kicks the bucket when they're 120, it will be considered a pediatric fatality. <laughs> they cash in their chips as <laughs> that. Think of Methuselah, Methuselah, nearly a thousand years old. Metu, death will come when he is sent away. It's the picture of the millennium. Methuselah, Methuselah. They will not have the same concept of sin. So the second aspect of the millennium is this. What would have happened had Israel accepted Jesus as the Messiah? How would history have been different? Well, that still has to happen. The original plan God had for Israel to be lights to the nations still has to happen. It will happen in the millennium. Well, why do we need it? Why do we need sacrifices in the millennium? Because those people born then will not have the same concept of sin. In the Old Testament, the blood sacrifices of those animals that were pictures of what the Messiah would do are pictures of what he did do. It'll be a way to teach them the gospel because they'll not have the concept. In the Old Testament, it taught about what the Messiah was going to do. He was the Paschal Lamb, got the scapegoat and all this. Well, in the millennium, these sacrifices will be somewhat different, but they'll be there. This is what he did do. God has never wanted robots, only children. Angels and men had to choose to respond to his love by loving him. Those people born then will have to make the same decision we do at the end of the millennium. Do you understand? But they'll have no basis to make that decision unless they were taught what sin is. That's why you've got the sacrifice. So you can think of the millennium, what would have happened if man did not sin? What would have happened if Israel accepted Christ? God's plan for the man and the planet and God's plan for Israel and the Jews still must happen. This is what the early church believed. All of this amillennial and postmillennial nonsense was invented by the church fathers to justify Constantine's pseudo-Christianization of the Roman Empire. It's all garbage. The early Christians never believed it. For Jesus to be the Messiah, he has to fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies, both the suffering servant ones and these conquering king ones. He has to restore the kingdom. The last thing the apostles are asking is that at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel. Now this is important. Think of the funeral of a believer a parent or a grandparent or something like that, and they go to be with the Lord, or a widow who's bereaved of her husband or vice versa, a widow or a terrible you know, death of a child, even these things. Okay. Oh, I wish he could be back for an hour. I wish she could be back just for two hours so I could tell her how much I love her. She's not suffering. He's not suffering. They're in the presence of the Lord. You're the one who's suffering. Forget about having them back for an hour or two hours. They're going to be back for a thousand years. You understand? The meek shall inherit the earth. How are you going to inherit the earth if there isn't going to be one? Oh, there's going to be an eternity. There's going to be an eternity. But the eternity is a new heaven. It's not paradise, not the one that's there now. Oh, who'd want to come back here when we can go be with the Lord? The Lord is going to be here. He's going to reign from Jerusalem. If you want to be where he is, you better be down here. It's not going to be like this. This is the world. It's going to be the earth. We'll be here for a thousand years. You've got six months to live, don't believe it. Even if the physicians are right, you have a thousand years plus six months to live. You're only going to go to sleep and wake up again. Now, I'm speaking here for saved believers. I'm not talking about unsaved people. You guys are in big trouble unless you put your faith in Jesus and repent and believe the gospel. I'm talking about believers. 
Let's continue. These animals are inimical in nature, in the world. In the earth, they won't be. Lions and lambs, leopards with goats. A little boy will lead lions. A cow and a bear will graze. They'll be non carnivorous They'll all be herbivorous. The young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child put his hand in the viper's den. Understand what this means. The nahash in Hebrew. The serpent beguiled the woman. Remember? Satan came into the serpent. Satan is going to be bound. In the millennium, you'll, there'll be no spiritual seduction. The lion and the serpent. Notice it talks about two dangerous animals. Okay. Satan goes around like a roaring lion. <laughs> He's not going to be able to do that in the, in the millennium. That's what it's saying in figure. You understand? The serpent beguiled the woman. He's not going to be able to seduce. Even a baby will, will not be taken in by it. Is it going to happen literally, zoologically? Yes, I believe it will. But there's a spiritual meaning to it. Everybody understand? We will be immune from these things. They'll not hurt or destroy my mountain. This is a big thing. The Temple Mount is important in prophecy all the way to Revelation 11. These things you see going on in the Middle East. Read Zechariah 12. Anybody who tries to divide that city is going to be in big trouble. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. That will happen. Now verse 10. Then in that day, the millennium, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as an ensign in Hebrew. The word is Nasi, for the people, a signal for the people, and his resting place will be glorious. Well, notice something. The Amim will resort to the root of Jesse. The Messiah had to make the Gentile nations believe in the Jewish God. Now you got another issue. The same verse is speaking of his first coming and his second. His own people after the flesh are the Jews. The next closest are the Arabs. Of all the nations in the world, the hardest to reach with the gospel are Jews and Arabs. His own people. It should be the Jews who are the first to accept him. The nations, the peoples, the word here is the peoples, actually. This is a problem for the rabbis. In his Guide for the Perplexed, Maimonides, the most important rabbi in the history of rabbinism, wrote that Jesus came to make the Gentiles believe in the Jewish God. That's how he explained it. He admitted that this happened. So that verse, although it is ultimately talking about the millennium, has a partial fulfillment in his first coming. How many people here are of Polish or Slavic descent? Put your hand up. How many people are of Germanic descent? How many people are of Irish or Celtic descent? How many people are of African descent? How many people of Hispanic descent? How many people are Asians descent? How many people here are Jewish? One or two. <laughs> the Goys believe in him. His own people don't yet. They will. The peoples resort to the root of Jesse. The Gentiles come to believe in the Jewish God. Now this demonstrates the folly of anti-Semitism. We hate you Jews. We don't like you Jews. We're against Israel. But we like your God. <laughs> you Jews are liars. But we believe your book. We're Christians. We don't like you. But we like your Christ. 
Doesn't even make sense. The Jewish rejection of them doesn't make sense. And the Gentile rejection of the Jews don't make sense. It makes no logical sense and certainly no theological sense. But when Jesus comes, it's all going to make sense. Verse 11. It'll happen in that day. The Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Tathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamat, and the islands of the sea. He'll lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Then the jealousy of Ephraim will depart and those who harass Judah will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, and Judah not harass Ephraim. Notice, Isaiah's own time. Now he speaks of his own time. The Babylonian captivity is coming. They're going to be scattered and regathered from Babylon. Seventy years is predicted by Jeremiah, Isaiah, recorded in Daniel. Isaiah's predicting it, so did Joel. It's coming. He's speaking for his own time and circumstances, the events that lie ahead historically leading up to the events of 585 B.C. Yeah, in his own time. But he says it's going to happen a second time. They're not just going to come back from Babylon. Something else is going to happen. And they're going to be regathered a second time. This is the second time. The rebirth of Israel in 1948, the Aliyah, the Zionist movement, call it what you will. And they're in Jerusalem. Let no one tell you these events in the Middle East do not fulfill prophecy. Oh, that's the Old Testament. No, Luke 21, 24 is the New Testament. Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles. Matthew 23, the Jews will be in Jerusalem to say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Zechariah 12, Jesus is the Old Testament, but he's speaking in the first person. This is to say nothing of passages in Thessalonians, Revelation, and the Old Testament that only make sense if you take the prophecies of Isaiah and Jesus literally. Do not believe the lie of replacement theology. Those people who believe in supersessionism and replacement theology are as crazy on one extreme as the hyper-messianic ones putting Gentiles under the law are on the other. Maybe even more crazy in certain respects. Both of them are nuts. Take your pick. I don't mean that to revile, but it's absolutely absurd. Replacement theology is absurd. I have never found an author, a preacher, a theologian who believes replacement theology who does not go off in some of their other fundamental doctrine. Because they're fundamentally misreading the scripture. If you don't understand God's purpose for Israel and the Jews, you are fundamentally misreading his word. The New Testament teaches incorporation of the Gentiles who believe, not replacement of Israel. Jews who reject their Messiah are cut off from their own tree. But if they repent and believe, they're grafted in again. No place does he get another tree. This is a separate subject, but understand what this text is saying. The Jews would be regathered a second time. This has happened. Just as Isaiah said, they came back from Babylon. Okay, that was his own time. Now he says it's going to happen again. So now you've got another thing. He's speaking of his own time. He's not speaking of the first coming. He's speaking of the second coming. <laughs> He's speaking of his own time and the second coming in the same passage. Not the first coming. Time sh frame shifts. He also says when this happens, there'll be no contention 
between Judah and Ephraim, going back to the time of Saul and particularly the time of David. You have this Israel and Judah thing, the ten northern tribes and the two southern ones. Ephraim became a byword for the ten northern tribes in Isaiah and other Old Testament prophets. It meant Israel, the north, the ten tribes. Judah was Benjamin and the tribe of Judah and the refugees from the north. Verse 14, they will swoop down on the slopes of the Philistines on the west. Together they will plunder the sons of the east. The Philistines, Philistinim, translated, what does Palestinian mean, Philistine? Only a Palestinian is not a real Philistine, anthropologically. He's an Arab. The Philistines were Indo-European Greeks from Crete. We know that from archaeology. They worship the fish god Dagon. You can go to the archaeological digs in Nassos and so forth in Crete and see what they believed. These were the ancient Philistines like Goliath. Well, where is the land of the Philistines? This is going to happen. They'll swoop down on the slopes of the Philistines. On, that's Gaza Strip. The area around it. Most of the land of the Philistines now the ancient land where the Philistines led, not the Arabs who call themselves Palestinians, but the original ones, Goliath's people. A Kiryat Gat, was where Goliath was from. Today that's a, a town a settlement filled with Russian Jews. They, they came in from the west and took it. It's going to happen. They'll utterly destroy it. Together they'll plunder the sons of the east. They will possess Edom and Moab, and the sons of Ammon will be subject to them. Something is going to happen with Jordan. Jordan is broken up into three regions. Ammon is the north. It's the capital, Ammon, where the Ammonites were. Central Jordan is Moab. Southern Jordan is Edom. It comes from the word Edom, red. Even the mountains are red. It's where Esau went. He had a red beard and red complexion. You've been to Ein Gedi and you look across the Dead Sea, you see it's red. I don't understand this. I've never understood it beyond a limited point. But Daniel tells us the only places geographically, in the Middle East certainly, that are not going to be controlled by the Antichrist will be these areas of Jordan and Moab and Edom, where Petra is. Mount Sa'ir, Bosra, this region. Daniel tells us they'll somehow escape the domain of Antichrist. But they will come under the strategic control of Israel. Now, again, that happened during the Hasmonean period. David reached Mediba, which is halfway between the Jordan River and the city of Amman. It's the Christian city in Jordan, Christianized. But, in the Hasmonean period, the eastern shore of the Dead Sea was conquered by the Jews. That's how Herod's parents, from Edom, they were Edomites. The Edomites who came to Israel were called Idumeans. <laughs> they were conquered forcibly in the Hasmonean period, in the intertestamental period. Again, it partially happened. But it's going to happen at the end of the age. That may explain an escape to Petra. Let's look. Something is going to happen in Jordan. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the Sea of Egypt. This may be the Gulf of Aqaba. And he will wave his hand over the river with a scorching wind. He will strike it into seven streams, like the Nile Delta and make men walk over dry shod. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant of his people who will be left, just as there was for Israel in the day that they came out of the land of Egypt. This is a direct reference to what's going to happen in the millennium in Isaiah 19. Let's look at it very briefly. I know most of you know this, or at least a lot of you. At the end of Isaiah 19, Verse 23, in that day there'll be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. 
the Assyrians will come into Egypt, the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. The nations will resort to the root of Jesse. And that day there'll be a third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth. When the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people. Egypt is people. And Assyria, the work of my hands. Assyria, people of northern Iraq. Today the Christians were being driven out of Iraq. Nominal Christians, most of them. The work of my hands and Israel, my inheritance. Yes, there will be peace in the Middle East when Jesus comes. There'll be a highway from Assyria to Egypt going straight to Israel, and they'll come and worship at the Feast of Tabernacles, we're told in Zechariah 14. That's how it will end. Well, now, let's go back very briefly in conclusion and work through this. Verse 1. Verse 2, first coming. Verse 3, verse 4, first coming but transitional. Verse 5, first coming, second coming, eternal. Sorry, verse 3. First coming but transitional. Verse 4, second coming. Verse 5, this is eternal nature. First coming, second coming, eternity. Verse 6, not just his second coming, but what comes after it. The millennium, looking towards eternity. Verse 7, verse 8, verse 9. All of it. Second coming in the millennium. Verse 10. First coming and second coming. Verse 11. Regathering of Israel. Second coming. Verse 12. Second coming. Verse 13. Second coming. 14. Second coming. Or the events leading up to it. Verse 15, 16. Establishment of the millennial kingdom. It shifts from one time frame to another. Verse 11, the second time. It's going to happen the first time he's going to regather, the second. The prophet's own time, the second. Shifting time frames. It seems complicated when you do the calculus. But when you do the arithmetic, it begins to make sense, doesn't it? Be brutally honest. Has what I've told you now helped you to understand Old Testament prophecy in a way you didn't look at it before as clearly? Put your hand up. <laughs> Again, I'm married to a math teacher. Don't teach calculus until the people can do the arithmetic. A little boy in New York looking through that hole, cutting the panel, watching them build a skyscraper. It doesn't make any sense. That picture, that thing, that this is, this is. Wait. Makes sense. Don't let this stuff scare you or confuse you. Jesus wants you to understand it. And he will teach you. He may use somebody like me by his grace. But remember, one is our teacher who is in heaven. God bless and thanks. See you tomorrow.